Thank you for coming out to support us, and more importantly, to hear from Joya Dilberto about her fantastic book, Coco with the Ritz. Izzy Abrams will be in discussion with Joya, so I think we are in for a real treat. Joya has written seven books, four biographies, and three historical fiction. She's also written a play. Why not? <laughs> Her books focus on women's lives, famous women, interesting women, mysterious, and sometimes troubled women. They've been, the books have been praised for combining rich storytelling and literary grace, I love that phrase, with deep research to bring alive different points of time and place. Jazz Age Paris, 19th century Chicago, Belle of Hope Paris, which I hope I pronounced right, and Disco Era, thank you, Dilla, Disco Era Manhattan. So I couldn't put Coco with the Ritz down, loved it, and in preparing to introduce Joya, um, I did some research and I went on her website and looked at uh, the other books she's written. And I found myself saying over and over, Ooh, that one looks great. Make a note. And the next one. Ooh, I'll have to read that one. Make a note. So, over and over. To name just a few, she wrote a biography of Diane von Furstenberg. Now, not everybody in the room is old enough, but how many of us had that left dress? <laughs> I think I, just, I was just thinking that. I think somewhere there's a picture of me in it. And I'm not, I don't want to find it or not. Anyway, and then um, and she wrote a biography of Hadley Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway's first of four wives. A book called The Collection, a novel about a young seamstress who went to work in Paris for who else? Coco Chanel, after World War I. And last but not least, a novel called I Am Madam X, a novel about both the subject and the artist of a famous painting hanging in the Met by John Singer Sargent, who happens to have it right here. Apparently, it's scandalous. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. just saying, just saying. Not surprisingly, Joya's work has been translated into several languages. In addition to writing all the books, she has taught at DePaul and Northwestern Universities taught writing, and also the Savannah College of Art and Design. <coughs> Joya has a grown son and is in Woodbury, Connecticut, with her husband. Joya will be in discussion with Izzy, the famous Izzy. <laughs> Izzy's the librarian, a librarian in Swampscott and who moderates a number of book groups. She teaches at senior residences around um, Boston and is former president of the JCC. So I think we have and two- And the Jewish Journal. And, and the Jewish, Jewish Journal, Journal. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so she's qualified, we'll keep her. <laughs> so Joya, now that I've shared my suspicion with you that you're my new favorite author, I want to thank you for coming to Marblehead. We're thrilled to hear from you. Ladies? Okay, I guess I get the mic there now, oh, yes, because that's, that's the, the only mic. <laughs> Passing the mic. Maybe. Thank you. So, what we're going to do first this evening, and Joya has agreed to do this, um, is to read a smallish section of the first couple of pages of the book. <coughs> For those of you who haven't read it, I wanted you to get a feel for what Joya has done. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here. This is my first time in Marblehead, and I walked around this afternoon. It's just a ridiculously charming town. <laughs> and I was, I was telling, I guess, Sarah, that in France, maybe some of you know this, outside these ridiculously charming places, there are signs that say one of the most beautiful villages in France. And I think you should have a sign that says one of the most beautiful villages in America. Um, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. That was really great. And um, I'm just so delighted to be here and that you're interested in, in my work. So I'm going to read the opening of the novel. This is um, 
in August 1944, and it's when Coco Chanel was arrested. And uh, she was arrested because she had spent the war living at the Ritz with a Nazi spy. <laughs> when the doorbell rang at 8.30 on that hot, languid morning, Coco knew they'd come to arrest her. She might have wondered for a moment if someone else was at the door, perhaps the laundress with fresh linen or a porter with a glove she dropped in the lobby. But she knew. Though the carpet muffled their footsteps, she sensed them striding down the hall at the Ritz, Coco and her animal cunning. She knew from the fierce jangle of the bell, from the way the maid's heels clicked so frantically across the floor and the door roared open. She knew. She crushed her cigarette in an ashtray. Her body trembled, surprising her. Lighting another cigarette, she took a moment to pull herself together. The room was warm with the white morning sun slanting through the windows, and the air had a stale floral scent. The mixed fragrances of number five perfume, tobacco, and pink roses which were displayed on the tables in crystal vases. Until that moment, she hadn't thought she'd been be arrested. Now she began to worry as she peeked out the bedroom door and saw the soldiers, the two young men from the French forces of the interior, standing in her suite with their grim expressions and guns tucked into their belts. Spots had already fled Paris with the retreating Germans. And Coco was alone, as she'd so often been in life, with her fame and her money and her secrets, which kept anyone from getting too close. Of course, the men have come for her because of spots. And that wasn't fair, because her German lover wasn't really a Nazi. He wasn't a cold-blooded killer. His mother was English, after all, and he lived in Paris for a third of his life. Why should she feel guilty about spots? Anyway, she wasn't going to hide in the closet or jump out the window. She wasn't a coward. There was a soft knock on the bedroom door. Coco opened it a crack and saw the maid. Mademoiselle, what should I do? The maid whispered. Ask them to give me a minute to dress, Coco said. If they take me and I'm not back in two hours, Tell the manager at the boutique to call Winston Churchill. The prime minister? Yes, his private number is in my book. Coco pushed the door shut and flipped through the hangers in her closet, deciding on her number two suit in navy blue jersey, a more casual version of the number one model she'd worn in her working days. From the jewelry box on her dressing table, she took three strands of pearls and a jeweled enameled cuff. She looped the pearls around her neck and secured the cuff on her wrist. Then she reconsidered the jewelry. No need to call attention to her prosperity. So she stuffed the pearls and the bracelet in a drawer. Coco was 61 though she looked younger thanks to expertly dyed dark brown hair and good bone structure. Arranging her face in determined expression, she smoothed her skirt and opened the bedroom door. Two ordinary youths dressed in brown slacks and plain white shirts stood in the foyer. She eyed the shiny pistols jammed into their belts. Their shirts flashed armbands emblazoned with FFI and the cross of the Lorraine, the symbol of the French forces of the interior, the loose band of resistance fighters, soldiers, and private citizens who'd taken up arms in the aftermath of the Germans' departure. Gabriel Chanel, come with us, said the taller youth. He had a spray of adolescent pimples on his cheeks, but his fine brown hair was already thinning. By whose order, she asked, louder than she intended. The people of France and the victims of fascism, said the second youth. 
He was short and stocky and looked even younger than his partner with smooth pink cheeks and curly chestnut hair. The maid was sobbing now, her face buried in her hands. Do you have any identification, Coco demanded. They would never see her cry. You must come with us, said the taller youth. Who gave you your orders? If you don't come voluntarily, we'll take you by force. Coco clasped her hands to stop them from trembling. On what charge? The taller boy spoke in a harsh, unflinching voice. Treason. So, um, I have some questions here that I'm going to ask Joya. And um, let's see, at the end of my talking with Joya, we'll take questions from the audience, okay? Um, what got you interested in Coco Chanel, and why did you write the book? Well, my first, in, oops, my first interest in Chanel was aesthetic. I've always loved fashion, and I was interested in how she revolutionized women's dress, how she got women out of floor-grazing skirts and corsets and fancy costumes with lots of ruffles and furbelows and those hats that were as big as catering trays and put them into sleek, simple, comfortable clothes that still define elegance and how most of us want to dress. And more to the point, I was interested in how that revolution in fashion that she started related to what was going on in the arts across the board after World War I. It was related to what Hemingway was doing in writing, what Picasso was doing in painting, what Stravinsky was doing in music, what Jean Cocteau was doing in film and on the stage. And she knew all these people. And they were all together feeding off of each other's ideas. And they were involved in this turning over of the old order and creating something new. She had an affair with Stravinsky. She worked with Picasso on a production of Antigone that Jean Cocteau did. She was very close to Jean Cocteau. Coco did the costumes and Picasso did the sets. She would have liked to have had an affair with Picasso, but Coco was exactly the kind of strong, independent woman he avoided like the plague. So that was never going to happen. And um, from there, my interest was in how she symbolized the spirit of her era. I'm always looking for these characters, and I only write about women, but I'm always looking for characters who somehow in their personality and accomplishments and flaws and crimes rise above the details of their lives to, to stand for something more. And to me, Chanel's treachery during World War II symbolized the treachery of France, the country. And in fact, in one place in the novel, she says, I am France. I think of her as kind of an anti-Marianne, the symbol of French liberty, equality, and fraternity. And you ask how I got interested in writing this book. Well, it's my second Chanel novel. Um, the first one was published by Scribner about 15 years ago, and it's set in Chanel's Italian in 1919 after the First World War. So I've been obsessed with this story and this woman for a long time. And um, when I was researching that novel, I learned about her arrest and interrogation on charges of treason by the FFI and wondered why nobody had written about it, including myself, all these books about Chanel, and no one had ever dealt with it. And that's what led me down the path to write the book. Can you tell us um, a little bit about Coco Chanel's background, because I think it's really interesting to find out where she came from and how did she get where she got. She came from the grimmest of childhoods. Her parents were unmarried, poor peddlers in the deepest, profoundest part of France. Uh, her mother and father had six children, and the mother died when Coco was 12 after she gave birth to her sixth child, who also died. And Coco's father put her and her two sisters in a convent orphanage. 
and set the boys out to work. And Chanel never saw her father ever again. And when she was 18, she aged out of the orphanage. She was gonna either have to become a nun or leave, and she wasn't gonna become a nun. So they got her a job mending trousers in a tailoring shop in Moulin, which was home to a regiment of very wealthy, aristocratic young men. And that was her first introduction to the world of wealth and aristocracy. And she became the mistress of one of the richest of these young men. His name was Etienne Balsain. And she also got a job um, at a cafe singing for tips. She was very ambitious and she wanted to be somebody. And she thought maybe a career in show business or music would be the ticket. And she didn't have any musical talent, but she had <laughs> two songs that both mentioned the word Coco in the refrain. And so the soldiers started calling her Coco and that's how she got the name Coco. Before that, she'd been called Gabby after Gabrielle. And um, should I go on or do you want to? <laughs> Let's move on to something else and we'll come back to that. Um, so, do you feel that um, Coco in any way believed in the Nazi ideology of that time? I, I, I don't think she believed in Nazi ideology. She said some very vile anti Semitic things, and we could talk some more about her anti Semitism. But I don't think she believed in Nazi ideology, and it's unclear even whether her boyfriend believed in Nazi ideology. Her boyfriend worked for the Abwehr, which um, was not the SS. They worked for the SS. They worked with the SS, but it was the German intelligence department that had been in place before Hitler ever came on the scene. And in fact, his boss, Wilhelm Canaris, was famously anti-Hitler and was beheaded by Hitler for being part of the plot to assassinate Hitler. So, but it's unknown, it's unknown what he, how he felt. He was surely a member of the Nazi party, but I don't, I don't think that she um, wanted the Germans to win. I think she was mostly an opportunist who was looking out for herself and her own interests. And if the Germans won, she was going to make sure she held on to her building on Rue Cambon and her business. But I don't, I don't think she went along with their ideology. Could you tell more, it tell us more about uh, Conko's lover, um, Spat, <laughs> his real name being Hans Gunther von Dinklage, am I pronouncing that correctly? And um, how their relationship began and how it evolved. Spatz was a very handsome blonde. He was 13 years younger than Coco. He spoke perfect French. His mother was British. He was from a warrior family, a military family. His father had been in the military and he had fought side by side with his father during World War I. He had lived in France for probably 20 years before the war, most of his adult life. Um, Coco probably met him at parties before the war because he was part of the same social set that she was. And he had been married to a half Jewish woman named Cassie, whom he divorced when the Nuremberg laws were passed. And it's he always said that it was not because of the Nuremberg laws that he divorced his half Jewish wife, that she wanted to divorce him too. And they in fact did remain friends. And she uh, remained in Germany throughout the war. And she lived part of the time in France, too. So there were no consequences to her for being half Jewish. But uh, he had had other lovers, many other lovers before Coco. But sometime after the Germans arrived in Paris, she encountered him again, and uh, probably at the Ritz, where she had an apartment. And the Nazis had taken over the Ritz Hotel. There was a giant swastika hanging off of the front entrance. And they had also confiscated her suite. 
and we gave her a smaller suite on the um, Rukhambal side of the hotel, the less desirable side of the hotel. All of the French collaborators were on that side of the hotel, the good side of the hotel they kept for the Germans and the German officers. Now, you will read in the book about um, cocoa and morphine, and this really fascinated me that she could carry on her life as she did and be addicted to a drug, a substance. Anything else you can tell us about why that started and um, what happened with it? Well, I'm, I'm not sure when it started, but she certainly, by the end of her life, she was addicted to morphine. Her best friend, uh, Nisia Serre, we've all seen paintings of Nisia Serre. She was painted by every artist of the Belle Epoque. Vuillard, Bernard, Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, there are lots of paintings of her all over mu museums in, in America and in France. And you would, you would, if we had a picture of her, you, would, you can... I'll go away later and you will, you will recognize her. And she was a morphine addict. So it's possible that she was the one that got Coco started on morphine. And it just, you know, like a bad drug habit, it get, only gets worse. You know, people don't modify or don't stay usually within a safe um, usage. Usually their drug addiction gets worse over the years. And that's what happened to her. So um, when we were talking, um, Julia said to me, um, when writing this book, I had to be creative, especially about the scene when, she, when Coco is being interrogated. Can you tell us what happened to that information? Was there any information? You did a great job at writing it, um, but I want to hear from you. Well, my first rule in writing historical fiction is to not contradict the known truth. So um, everything in the novel that's made up is made up because it, the, the truth isn't known or um, the, it could have happened. I never, I never write anything that, that I know for a fact didn't happen. But in the case of Coco during World War II, almost nothing is known. So I had great latitude to invent, which is the best situation for an historical novelist to, to not have any information really to go on and to be so that so that you could I, the only way to access this story was imaginatively because so little was known. And part of it is because she didn't talk about it. She paid people to keep her out of their memoirs. And also in terms of the interrogation which is the last, I don't know, 50 pages or so of the book, um, nothing is known because it wasn't official. So there were no records as there would have been in an official court case. Nothing, nobody who was involved in her arrest came forward to say that they were part of it or that they had interrogated her. We do know because she was seen taken away in the Jeep by these guys. And she said, that she had been taken away by them. But she never said where they took her. She never said what they asked her. Um, so I, I was completely free to invent it. And that was, to me, the most exciting and fulfilling part of writing the book, because that's what had really drawn me to it. I was The thing that had really fascinated me and gripped me from the start was the fact that Coco Chanel had been arrested and interrogated and somehow set free. And what was that about, and what did it mean? Um, we have a couple of, uh, or a couple of brothers in the book who are Jewish, the Wertheimer family, and um, they play an important part of the story of Chanel. And I'd like you to like, give us a brief synopsis of that, so people will know that. I think it's important. Well, the, the Jewish Wertheimer family still owns Chanel. Um, Pierre, and did you all know that? No. Um, so Pierre, Pierre and Paul Wertheimer back in the 20s owned the most um, important perfume company in France. 
and perfume is very important in France, as always has been. And when Chanel started designing clothes, she got this idea that she wanted a perfume to enhance her fashion, a perfume that would express the modernist spirit of her clothes. And so she hired them to develop what became Chanel Number no. 5. And she thought it was just going to be a little side thing to help her sell clothes. She never dreamed that it was going to explode like a champagne bottle left out in the sun and become this you know, mega hit. To this day, every 30 seconds, someone somewhere in the world buys a bottle of Chanel Number no. 5. When she entered into this agreement with the Wertheimers, she took, they had 80% of the profits, she took 10%, and another investor had 10%. And when it became so successful, she decided that she wanted more. And so she kept suing them. She sued them and sued them and sued them, and nothing ever came of the lawsuits. And then the Germans are occupying Paris, and they're taking away businesses from Jews. And she gets this idea that she's going to use the Nazi race laws to get her company back. Now, the Wertheimers were safe. They were in New York, and she knew that. She knew their lives weren't in danger. They had taken with them to New York the formula for Chanel Number no. 5. They had also taken a large supply of extract, of jasmine extract, which is a key component of Chanel number no. five, and they were manufacturing it out of Hoboken, New Jersey, and they were selling it in drugstores and PXs, and it, would be, it was becoming even more popular, very, very popular among Americans. And the Warhammers also, but she did go to the Gestapo. She went to the Gestapo and said, my company has been abandoned by its Jewish owners, and it should revert to me. But they had outsmarted her. The work of Paul Wertheimer um, and Paul and Pierre had transferred their shares to an, a French Christian businessman named Felix Amio, who happened to be making airplanes for the Luftwaffe. And the quid pro quo, it's unclear whether Amio was collaborating on his own or whether he'd been forced to make airplanes for the Germans. But the quid pro quo was that if the Allies won, Amio would give the shares back to the Wertheimers, and they would vouch for him as a good Frenchman who didn't really want to collaborate with the Germans. So what you have here is the Jewish Wertheimers collaborating with the collaborator. And so nobody in this story comes out smelling like Chanel number no. five. <laughs> and, and it's the moral, the moral ambiguity of things that really interested me and was something that I wanted to explore. So why did Coco remain at the Ritz during the war? It was, it was her home. The Ritz was her home. She um, had an apartment at 31 Combo above her boutique. It's still there. It's been preserved as it looked when she lived there. It had a living room, a dining room where she entertained. She kept her clothes there. It must have had a bathroom also. It had a little office, but it didn't have a bedroom. She went across the street to the Ritz every night to sleep. She loved hotel living, and it provided the comfort and the, the friendship, I guess, of the staff that was this replacement for a family, and she never had a family. And um, she, she was not going to leave the Ritz when the Nazis occupied it because she belonged there. And, you know, somebody else would have thought, you know, it's not a great idea to be living in this Nazi hive. I better find, I better sleep across the street. But she, she went ahead and, and kept, her, kept a smaller suite there and stayed throughout the whole thing. And presumably, you know, saw Nazis every day. So we know that she left um, France and she was in Lausanne for what, 10, was it, how many years? About 10 years, yeah. So in 1954, something happens and um, it's like Chanel is reborn or reinvented. Could you comment on that? 
So when she was released from uh, the FFI after two hours of interrogation, and we can we talk about that too later, um, she very quickly fled to Switzerland and lived in exile in Switzerland for, for 10 years. Um, <laughs> she was so furious that she couldn't get her company back that she stopped wearing Chanel number no. five herself. And she started bad mouthing it, saying that it was bad perfume and an inferior perfume. And she also started manufacturing rival perfumes in violation of her contract with the Wertheimers, basically cutting off her nose to spite her face because it was Chanel number no. five that was the cash cow and that was making them all rich, including her. But she was you know, not going to say anything good about it. And she was now wearing Chanel number no. 19, which she was manufacturing herself. And the Warheimers knew about this. They, they heard about it. And they couldn't have this. They couldn't have the founder bad-mouthing the company Cash Cow. And so here, and they were also very worried that if the press started writing about this, it was going to really be bad. The brand was going to take a big hit. You know, how are they going to explain the fact that Chanel is saying that Chanel number no. five is an inferior scent. Um, and they also were worried that it was going to come out that she had lived with a Nazi during the war, and that was also going to be really bad for the brand. And so Pierre Wertheimer went to, and perfume sales had started to flag a bit also. So he, he went to Switzerland and talked to Coco, and he said, look, you've got to stop. You have to stop saying bad things about Chanel number no. five. You've got to stop manufacturing these rival perfumes. You know, what do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. And what she wanted was the moon. She said, I want you to pay for my life. I want you to pay for my taxes. I want you to pay my bill at the Ritz. And most of all, I want to go back to designing clothes. She had closed her house in 1939 on the eve of war. It's now 1954. So she had been out of it for a long, long time, and she's also now over 70. Nobody really knows why she closed her house in 1939. She always said that it was because she saw that war was coming and that nobody would be interested in couture, but she stayed open during World War I. So that is a mystery that remains. But in any case, Pierre agreed to bankroll her return to fashion. So she goes back to Paris in 1954, she, after being away from fashion for 15 years, she produces a collection, and that's when she did the famous boucle suit that um, everybody thinks of as the iconic Chanel piece of clothing. And the French panned the collection because they knew what she had done during the war, and they were going to forgive her that easily. But we in America did not know about her personal life, and so Americans embraced this return of the fashion messiah as, you know, the best thing that had happened in fashion since whenever. And it was America that made her the big hit that she was the second time around. Um, Chanel, as a person, you obviously deal with that in your book, but what about Chanel as a brand? And this leads to another question. Um, should we not purchase Chanel because of Coco's behavior during the war? So I'm asked this a lot if I think Chanel ought to be canceled. And um, so many people are getting canceled. Who can keep up with it, right? So um, I, first of all, I make a distinction between the founder, the person, Coco Chanel, and the brand. And I don't think, I absolutely do not think either of them should be canceled. So if you're wearing Chanel, you don't have to leave. Even if you have a <laughs> Chanel lipstick in your purse, you don't have to leave. Um, and, I, and I think that Chanel, I think she needs to be given credit for her accomplishments. You know, she accomplished so much against such terrible odds. Um, and she did, she did influence style and design, and she has to be given credit for that. But she also behaved abominably during the war, and I think that has to be reckoned with. And it's too bad that the company doesn't. If you go on the Chanel website, there's no mention of spots or the war. 
if in the timeline of her life that they have on the website, there's nothing about the war or about her living with a Nazi. Um, and in all of the many promotional films, little 12 minute, 15 minute films that Chanel, the Chanel company has done, you've probably seen some of them, they're online, they are shown before movies and movie houses. Um, there's no mention of any of this. These little films are done with very high Hollywood production values and famous stars like Keira Knightley and Nicole Kidman and Kristen Stewart and Geraldine Chaplin. And there's only one mention of spots and the war in all of this. And that's in a film that Karl Lagerfeld directed um, in 2015. Karl Lagerfeld who took over Chanel um, in the 80s and died a couple of years ago. Um, and in this, it's a little, like, 11-minute film, and it stars Kristen Stewart as Chanel, and she's playing in a faux bio of Chanel, and there's, they're having a meeting with the faux director, and she says to the faux director, well, are we going to put spots in the movie? Because he's an important part of her life, and the director said, the, the actor playing the director says, no, we're only going to talk about the happy, successful years. So that's the company's attitude. You know, ignore it because it's ugly and unpleasant. So um, I think in, in talking together, we, we kind of felt that um, we should be talking a little bit about anti-Semitism in light of what is occurring in our modern day society and what was happening in, in Paris at that time. Do you want to comment on that and how you wanted to have this reflected in your novel? Well, I think that the, you know, one, there's one thing that I want readers to take away it's the, from this, it's how important it is to stand against evil. Evil people can't exist without the passive cooperation of many, many, many other people. Hitler could have been stopped. You know, and and I think it's very and very, very, very important to stand against evil whenever you see it in big and small ways. And Chanel didn't. She went along with it, like so many people did. And that's the great tragedy of her. And um, that's the great tragedy of our world that um, people look the other way and they don't, they don't face up to what's happening around them and let it happen. And, um, you know, it's so troubling what's happening now. And uh, I, I think that it's a real cautionary tale. I think her story is a real cautionary tale. And the French have never really come to grips with what happened during World War II. Um, it's amazing that they, that they, I mean, there's the, the, the history of anti-Semitism in France is so deep. You know, we all read about Alfred Dreyfus, um, and, it, and she probably heard a lot of anti-Semitic things when she was growing up in the convent orphanage. She hung around with all these anti-Semitic right-wing people. Um, so, you know, it was there in the air, and, and yet, you know, and to me also one of the one of the most horrible things she did. I mean, I don't think sleeping with spots was as bad, was the worst thing she did. I think that was due more to weakness than wickedness. But denouncing her Jewish partners, Gestapo, that was, which is based, she did do that. That's based on fact that's been documented, not the details that I embellished in the novel, but she did do that. And also, she did not sign the petition that might have saved her friend, the Jewish surrealist poet, Max Jacob. Um, and Picasso, who was his very best friend, also didn't sign it. And Jean Cocteau, who was behaved like a, a more obvious collaborator than either Chanel or anybody else in her circle during the war, he was going to the German embassy and you know, consorting with these guys, and he 
would do things like write a great review of Arnold Becker, who was Hitler's favorite sculptor. He was doing all these sort of very, very obvious collaborationist things. And yet he was the one that started the petition for Max Jacob and tried to save him. And it's unclear what eventually happened to that petition. Um, it doesn't, it d didn't survive. It's unknown if it ever got to the desk of the Nazi who could have perhaps saved Jacob. But Jacob was arrested, even though he was posing as a monk and living in a Catholic monastery. He had, turned, he had actually converted to Catholicism. Um, and he died uh, in, at Drancy at a holding, in a holding cell on his way before they could send him to Auschwitz. So, um, you know, that, and, and it's unknown absolutely for sure that she didn't sign it, but everybody who was around her at the time and around Picasso um, say that both, neither of them signed the petition for Max Jacob. And I just, I, I find that completely unforgivable. Now it's time for you to ask questions if you have any questions. How many have read the book so far? Okay. And um, it's good to see that. I hope many more of you buy the book to read it. It's fascinating. And um, I have read the book and I was immediately, I, first of all, I was immediately struck by how uh, accurate everything was that could be accurate and um i was into that period in you know in france the belle époque and i thought wow this this author really has it together and um and in the way she wrote so i'm going to encourage you and i'm thinking about even doing this with a book group or two because i think it's an important book that we all should read even though it might change our ideas a little bit um, I think Joya has done a fantastic job. And if there are questions, please raise your hand. Sarah, I'm going to give you the mic. All right. Then talk loudly. Um, are there any other houses that were owned by Jewish entrepreneurs um, that were affected in any similar way to Coco Chanel? Did you all hear the question? She no. asked. <laughs> she asked. She asked if there were any other houses who were owned, that were owned by Jews that were affected by who were affected by the war. Um, not that I know of. There were a lot of houses that were owned by Nazi sympathizers. However, <laughs> there were and yes, well, no, not all of them closed. And in fact, that raises a really interesting point about the connection between fashion and fascism. Um, you know, fashion is about, even though, you know, you'll hear a lot of stuff from Anna Winter about how we're all, you know, going for diversity and we're, in, we're being inclusive and whatever, but fashion is about, it's about exclusion and it's about elites and it's about charismatic leaders like Coco Chanel and Karl Lagerfeld and so on. And John Galliano, and you all might remember that very ugly episode a few years ago when Galliano, who was the head of Dior, the head designer at Dior, was caught on tape in a Paris bar saying some very vile anti-Semitic remarks to a woman. Do you remember that, reading about this? And um, the woman wasn't even Jewish. And he, he was um, fired from Dior and he was fined, I think, $8,000, because now in France, it's a hate crime to say anti-Semitic things. And his career was ruined. He's what a vile guy he is. But, you know, there are a lot of them that are like that. They hold themselves up as, you know, these arbiters of taste and style, and they're very fascistic in the way that they present themselves and conduct their business and their lives. But in his remarks to this woman, which I won't repeat because I, they're just too horrible. He started out criticizing her boots. And from there, it went on to criticizing her and criticizing her for being Jewish, even though she wasn't Jewish, as it turned out. So the point that I'm making is that there's a slippery slope between condemning somebody for not wearing the right boots or not wearing the right dress or carrying the right handbag or wearing the right perfume to condemning them, their very flesh. 
And a lot of their, you know, think of L'Oreal, the owners of L'Oreal um, were also connected to fascist leaders and to Nazis. And there, there's a, there's a, and um, there's just a, a history of it in fashion, of fashion being connected to fasc fascistic leaders and during the war, Nazis like Jacques Fath, he doesn't exist anymore. But some of them kept their houses open and um, worked with the Nazis who had control, who controlled couture. And at one point, they were talking about moving the couture business to Berlin. And um, but they regulated how many costumes they could show during the collections and how much fabric they could use and, and so on and so forth. So there, there is that very troubling, unsettling connection between the two. But I can't think of any other. I think there were, there were Jewish-owned ancillary businesses to couture, like Fourier's, Fourier's and some of the embroidery houses, maybe, and of the shoemakers and so on, and handbag makers. But I can't think of a, a fashion house that was owned by, by Jews. Other questions? Any, but I don't want to cut anything. Is there somebody else back there? Okay, you want to take the mic? You were great, by the way, both of you. Thank you. So I was surprised to hear you say, Joya, that after the war, the French people were basically angry at her and didn't want, you know, to buy her perfume. So. It seems, have they gotten over that? Because Chanel is pretty much everywhere in, uh, in France. So that's, that's my question. Yes, I think they've gotten over it. <laughs> and the, the brand, I think, you know, if you're, it's a good brand to work for. And I mean, I don't know who's buying those I don't know the people, but that's not how they make their money. They make their money with the perfume and the handbags and the, and the sunglasses and so on. And they've been brilliant about advertising. Um, you know, why? I, I sometimes meet girls who want more than anything a $6,000 Chanel handbag, but they don't know that Coco Chanel was a real person. So, you know, they've, they've managed to, to create the desire people to have Chanel. They're, they're a brand with soul, it's called, because they're so aspirational. Um, but to your previous question about Jews owning business, fashion businesses, in America, look at Ralph Lauren, Diane von Furstenberg, Donna Karen, Calvin Klein. You know, it's, it's a, in America, it, it's the big designers, certainly from that era of the 70s when American fashion was first coming into its own, were, were Jewish. And in fact, um, Calvin Klein and Donna Karen and um, Ralph Lauren pretty much all grew up on the same street. <laughs> yeah, I know, which is really sort of interesting. Any others? Yes, I'll come down to you. How's that? I don't want you to have to scream. <laughs> Uh, when you read the initial paragraph about uh, Coco Chanel being interrogated, you talked about the phone number that she had in her pocketbook uh, from, of Winston Churchill. And is that something that uh, was based on facts or um, you know, in that relationship she had with him? Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> ruin any of the book, but uh, I just wondering if that it was true. <laughs> Yes, Joy, do you want to comment on Winston Churchill? Yes, she was friends with Winston Churchill. She had had a romance with the Duke of Westminster, who was a friend of Churchill's. The Duke of Westminster was at the time the richest man in the world, and uh, he and Coco were together for I don't know, a few years, and he, she got to know Churchill then, country house parties, and Churchill really liked her a lot. He found her very intelligent and witty, and he 
He admired what she had done, how she had built this business pretty much on her own. And um, after Chanel broke up with the Duke of Westminster, Churchill stayed in touch with Chanel. In fact, he had dinner with her in her uh, apartment above her atelier right before the war, right, well, right before the Germans arrived. And he was, the last time he was in Paris before the occupation, he had dinner with Coco Chanel. So um, she, she had his number. She, uh, there are some letters. I'm not sure how many, there may be just be two. There are a couple of letters that she wrote to him that are in the Churchill archives. And uh, it, a lot of people think that it was Churchill who made the phone call that got her released from the FFI interrogation. But I don't, and, I, and who knows what Chanel, Chanel doesn't even know what, how, why she was released. I don't think. Nobody knows why she was released. But a lot of people think it was Churchill who intervened on her behalf. I don't think so, because it's, it's like... August, September 1944, and I think Churchill had more important things to worry about than getting Chanel out of FFI custody. And she also could, it also could have been Pierre Reverdy, who's a character in the book, and who was a poet uh, that Chanel also had had an affair with and stayed friendly with. She was his benefactress also. He was in the resistance. It's possible that he had connections to these FFI people and somehow intervened. And it's also possible that they just let her go, that they thought they just didn't have enough to hold her on. So nobody really knows why she was, why she got out of it. Okay. One more question, if anyone has one. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, Beth. So I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I thought you did a, a wonderful job in making her real, a, a real, a, almost a sympathetic uh, character without making her sympathetic because of uh, her, um, what she did and uh, the actions that she took. <laughs> I had a question though. Do you think that Schwartz was told to pursue her initially and it may, might have evolved into a different nature of a relationship, but because she was such a symbol of France, that if he had, um, you know, if their relationship became public, that maybe the French would be uh, more pro-Nazi. Pro um, that's a super interesting question. Did, did everybody hear that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think probably that was in the mix, that she was really connected and powerful and rich. And, you know, she continued to support him after they broke up. She uh, continued to send him checks from a trust that she had set up that was in Switzerland. And that was partially to buy his, his silence. She also paid the medical bills and the funeral of uh, Walter Schellenberg, who was the, um, the, 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 intel the German intelligence chief who was tried at Nuremberg, who wrote a huge doorstop of a memoir called Labyrinth, and, and there's no mention of Chanel in it. But so I do think, I think that, I don't think it was anything as obvious as, oh, I better go after Chanel because she can help me. But I think that was definitely, definitely in the mix. Um, and she often paid for the way of her lovers. She was often the one who, she was attached to men, not Stravinsky and not Boy Capel, who was the great love of her life, but or not certainly not the Duke of Westminster. But a lot of her boyfriends were bankrolled by her. So that wasn't unusual. But I, I do think that there was some quid pro quo there about about how she would, he, she, he would pave the way for her in Nazi-occupied Paris, make life easier for her, and she would introduce him to people and pave the way for him in Parisian society. Um, 
if there is no Sarah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, you can look. Oh, you're closing. All right, fine. I didn't know that. Okay. Now I know that. I thought it was other Sarah, but okay. Um, I want to thank Joya for coming to Marblehead and joining us for our book festival here at the center. And I want to thank the Boston Yard Club for hosting us here and for Carpet Dog Books for selling books. Don't forget the book. Um, I, I think, you know, when I, when I first talked to you, I said, you know, it, it, this whole book is, is questionable. It is what went on is questionable, and I think people need to really hear the behind the scenes of really what you wrote about. And I think you did it so wonderfully tonight, and really gave um, gave us a great a great bit of knowledge too. So can we all thank? Who's going to finish up? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Joya. That was really interesting. I have not read the book, but I plan to. Um, it's, it fascinates me, the whole industry and how it was affected, like everyone else, during the Second World War. Um, next up, on Thursday, November 10th at 7 p.m. at the JCC, we have The Last Rose of Shanghai. And I hope I get this right because I'm not wearing my reading glasses. Vina Del Randell. Close? I think it's Wina. Wina Van Randell. Please come join us. It's at the JCC. And again, thank you so much for coming. This I, I look out and see all these wonderful faces. Come back and, and join for the rest of the festival. Um, I believe is going to be signing books over at the table. And um, please, please, um, it, it makes for a good read. It really does. Thank you.